All right, so in the spirit of Lit RPG. So what we're going to be doing is for each question, each question is going to have an assigned point value. And one person is going to choose to take the question or not, you know. And then a, a second person can also answer it after them for half points. Whoever wins at the end, all right, so we all have some, some gift baskets up here going on. Whoever wins, though, gets the secret first place winner prize. Oh, yes, it is not a book. It, they totally thought it was a signed book. I, I can see it in their eyes. They're like, hey, great. <laughs> All right. Um, so just so you know, I have a certain amount of questions, but it should equal out where they have about the same amount of points at the end. So for them to win, we need, we're going to need questions from other people uh, for them. Otherwise, they're just going to kind of probably be around the same amount of points, except for James who will have like double or triple. So, do, do I have to make a buzzing noise when I answer? No, you just like raise your hand. Okay, all right. Yeah. Right now. Now. Can we have other people's hands down? Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah. All right. And yes, On you the can end, fight so for the question. I only have to worry about fact, Matt. This is it. optimal position. <laughs> you can fight for the question. In fact, we encourage it, okay? <laughs> um, now, they, they all have had a chance to see the questions and prepare for them, so it should be a really good uh, round today. All right, and that's all I have for the next two minutes. And, and if there's a tie, I'm not sure if you need to buzz in and ask one of the party or you can just do whatever. Yes, I do. Who's counting these points? Shannon. I feel, so. I feel like you should be literally second in this question. <laughs> there will be no recounts. I don't know you, but I love you. <laughs> in fact, I encourage bribes. <laughs> in the hand, two in the bush, and all that fun stuff. Ooh, 30 seconds. The clock up here is wrong. No, it's Trish, right? Yeah. You guys ready? About to start. It'll be fun. All right, hello everyone and welcome to the Lit RPG panel. I'm so glad you all have a seat, but you're only going to need the edge. All right, guys, today we are doing the Lit RPG uh, game show. So for uh, anyone who did not hear this already, what we'll be doing is a series of questions. Each author will get a chance to answer questions, um, and then a second person can answer the same question for half of the points. Uh, at the end, uh, we're hoping that other people will come up and give them points. Each of those questions at the end will be worth five points. Um, so we're going to get started with uh, just a quick introduction. I'm Dakota Kraut. Um, I'm the owner and uh, uh, president of Mountain Dale Press. Um, and I'm going to let every person introduce themselves. And what I'm hoping they'll do is uh, describe what you write, the coolest thing about your system, your favorite character, and your subgenre in lit RPG. All right. Want to start, Mike? Uh, <clears throat> Hi, uh, I'm Ramon Mejia. I'm best known for the, uh, being the host of the Lit RPG podcast, which reviews Lit RPG books on a weekly basis. Um, I'm also a writer in the genre, writer of the name R.A. Mejia. Um, I write Lit RPG, of course. That's the only thing I've ever written and could probably ever write. Um, the coolest thing about my system is probably going to be the crafting. Um, I love crafting and making and designing uh, things for my characters to do in their world, um, so I put a lot of effort into that. My favorite character is probably Repair. He's a character I created when I was a teenager who just longed for friends to play RPG games with. And I brought him to life in a recent book called The Mechanical Crafter. And so he's definitely a very heart-oriented character for me. Um, and my favorite sub-genre within Lit RPG is probably gonna be transported 
to the RPG world systems. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Chatfield. Um, I write the Ten Realm series, Emerilia series. Um, I meddle with science fiction, fantasy, and lit RPG. Um, I think the thing I enjoy the most is actually how I can blend those things together, and it kind of works, apparently. Um, so it, that's always good fun. Um, I just, like, I love writing books, so there's not one thing I can really pick out, and with characters, I couldn't pick one out either because, you know, even in the Ten Realm series, I've got two main characters, which is a little difficult to pick between them. Um, also, I don't want to be roasted alive, so I don't think I should. Um, but yeah, I really like uh, Portal um, uh, Lit RPG. It's a lot of fun. Um, but I also love a science fiction Lit RPG, and that's something I'm looking at in the future. Anyway. Uh, I'm Eric Ugland. I write the good guys and the bad guys. Um, what am I supposed to do? Oh, yes. Okay. So two Sorry, people in this. It gets fuzzy. So what you write, the coolest thing about your system, your favorite character, and your subgenre. Uh, coolest thing about my system is probably the gore and the monsters. Uh, Matt asked me to say that Donut is my favorite character in my books. <laughs> and you told me. And then, um, my, I guess my subgenre is Isekai Portal Fantasy. I owe him 10 bucks. Um, so my name is Matt Dinneman. I write uh, a book series called Dungeon Crawler Carl. Uh, thank you, whoever said that. Um, <laughs> the, the favorite thing about my system is the, the system, AI, it's a, they're stuck on a reality, intergalactic reality television show, and the AI changes the rules as he sees fit as it goes along, just like a regular reality TV show. Um, my favorite character is probably a character named Samantha. She's a reanimated uh, talking sex doll head. Uh, and she tell you everything you need to know about the series right there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's considered post-apocalyptic lit RPG. Uh, my name is James Hunter. Um, I'm a, a lit RPG game lit writer. Uh, I also run Shadow Alley Press with my wife Jeanette. I've written a bunch of series, Viridian Gate Online, Rogue Dungeon, Shadowcroft Academy for Dungeons with my buddy Aaron, Bibliomancer with my buddy Dakota. Um, I have a lot of different systems. Uh, I, I like to combine um, different elements from different systems together. That's something that I like to play with in Rogue Dungeon. Uh, I, I, uh, Rorik is this sort of hedge mage from a parallel dimension who's isekai'd into an, an, an alternate dimension MMO. And so there's kind of this combination of his magic with the in-game magic, and I like exploring those possible combinations. Um, probably my favorite character, uh, there's a bunch, but I really like Kaz from the Rogue Dungeon series. He's this, uh, yeah, for salt. Uh, he's this, uh, this dungeon troll who uh, discovers food and has an obsession, a love obsession with cooking and the great flavors that are available in the world. And uh, it changes his life and, and his battle cry is for salt because that's what he's fighting for at the end of the day, a good meal and a good beer. So yeah, those are, those are my favorites. Perfect. Okay, so we're gonna start right away. And now please uh, let, me, uh, let me finish the question before you raise your hand if, if you want to answer it. So first thing, <clears throat> Can any of you define lit RPG for the audience? Ramon was the first for 10 points. Um, lit RPG or literary RPG uh, stories is a combined uh, fantasy and science fiction with RPG game mechanics. Um, and, and the mechanics are as important to the world as physics are. Would anyone like to expand on that for half credit, Eric? All right. Can I? Uh provide a counterpoint yes, answer? Yes, you can. Uh, absolutely, you can. I would say that, that you don't have to be fantasy or sci-fi. I think there are plenty of other ones, including westerns and horror. I would say that uh, lit RPG is more a style of writing than a genre of writing, where you have the importance of game mechanics being visible and level progression in addition to a story. I see that's a great answer, but it's only worth half, so kind of <laughs> move faster on the arms, yeah. <laughs> All right, so another easy one for 10 points here. Of the subgenres of lit RPG, why did you choose the one to write in uh, over the other ones? Eric. Uh, I chose uh, Isekai uh, slash Portal Fantasy just because I find uh, with the VR, I mean, when I started writing it, the subgenres weren't as um, 
catalyzed and, and specific as they are now. And uh, I didn't want to do dungeon core. I wanted to have someone who could travel around and have a, a more interesting world to explore. And I didn't want to have to deal with figuring out what the real world would be doing while you're stuck in VR. And James for half. Ah, yeah, that's right, suckers. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting the hang of this. I'll get there. Uh, so I, I originally um, started writing VR, uh, and, and I, I did sort of a post-apocalyptic VR where, where the game is actually sort of a, a, a life raft for similar reasons that Eric mentioned, which is I really didn't want to figure out what people were going to do in the real world. So I was like, well, I'm just going to destroy the real world. And, and then there's only the game. And so that was a big part of that. Uh, when I started doing Rogue Dungeon, the reason why I, I picked that was actually I read the, the Divine Dungeon series and I really loved uh, Dungeon Core. Um, but I wanted to do something different and something unique, something that Eric mentioned, not being able to travel around. I really wanted the, the sort of dungeon overload to, to be able to have a little bit more mobility, so I worked that into it. But I loved the idea of anti-heroes. Uh, that's always been a character a sort of archetype that I really enjoy is, is looking at how the bad guys um, are, are not ever really the bad guys in their own story and, and how these, these dungeon mobs are really just sort of defending their home space from these, these very terrible intruding heroes. So that was one of the things that really drew me to that genre. Very cool. Great answers. All right. Next question here. What is the hardest thing about writing lit RPG versus writing another genre? All right, I'm going to give it to Michael because you had your hand up before the question was over. Sorry. All right. I think the, one of the hardest things is making the complex simple. Especially like these systems can take weeks or months to develop and then you have to really quickly say, okay, this is a system, this is how it works, here's a few stat screens and like really integrate on, okay, now we are all on the same page, let's go with it. Because it's kind of like, like the talk about uh, it's physics in the world, but you're reestablishing physics. So that can be really fun. Um, Building Excel documents um, is really fun. I know that uh, my friend Dakota Crowd definitely helped me out with that, um, and that was a lot of work, um, but it does make things a lot easier to do. Um, and you've got to balance um, your stat sheets to advance the book, but not bog it down. Because it's so easy to go, I want to have all the stats to show these things are happening, but then your story can't you know, get as fast as it's, it wants to be. Um, but yeah, those are some of the hardest things you've got to like do. And uh, Sal Ramon first. Uh, I think Michael hit a lot of like the major points of what are the challenges in lit RPG, but I th think what one on a storytelling side is making the RPG mechanics um, have a logical extension of their effect on the world, especially if you're going to do um, like a Seki um, kind of fiction where your characters are transported to a fantasy world that has RPG mechanics for a very long time. Like, what are the ramifications for a uh, a, a world system that's not necessarily based upon money power, but RPG power. Like, what are the long-term um, lore ramifications for, for different stratifications of society? And just getting that balance right to make it feel very natural to this world, um, yet still be exciting and interesting for your, for your readers to do is sometimes kind of a challenge, an exciting challenge, though. Perfect. All right, so we are 10 minutes in, so points are now going to be worth 15 points, or questions are worth 15 points. Uh, half credit is only seven, because we round down. Um, <laughs> so, big question here and very important. What benefit to the genre are we seeing from mainstream media such as Free Guy? Oh, Matt, that's an audience agreed. I, you know, it's kind I'm of being interesting. Being discriminated. It, for me, at least, it, be, it makes it a lot easier to explain what lit RPG is when there are movies like the Jumanji movie, the Free Guy movie. Uh, you can say, hey, what sort of books do you write? And then people ask, well, is it a game? Do, is it a choose-your-own-adventure? And that's the sort of questions I get when I sell books at cons, because that's what I do for a living, is I sell artwork at cons. At least I did before I started writing Dungeon Crawler Carl. And it, it's a good entry point to explain what the genre is, and more people are interested, and they say, I really like that movie, Free Guy. Um, I really liked the new Jumanji movie, where they're stuck in the video game. And I said, well, you know, there's a whole genre of fiction that's a lot like that. And it makes life a lot easier. Absolutely. I'm going to give him an additional four points for a charisma bonus because I got four big head nods the whole time there. <laughs> All right. All right, for half credit. Um, I'm going to say like the same kind of question, answer. Uh, brand awareness is a very big benefit for, for 
the publicity from these kind of movies. They're not exactly like advertising as literary Geo Gianluca, but they are making people aware that this type of storytelling does exist. For me, uh, it was the, the anime um, Starter Online that really got me interested in this kind of storytelling that incorporated the video games that I loved and, and storytelling in, in the fantasy kind of genre world. And that love for that particular entry genre made me explore, like, are there other stories in the world for this? And looking at Amazon just becoming inundated and, and falling to that super duper amazing little bit rabbit hole. And for other people, their entry may be these kind of movies and, and stories. Perfect. Excellent answer so far. This is why I picked this group, they're great. All right, so uh, still at the 15 point here. How do you like to address power creep? So by that, in worlds where there is often no cap, how do you keep a pacing that doesn't rush ahead of the story and the world lore itself? I can go with Ramon. <laughs> Sorry, I have the advantage of just being so close and short. It's true. Yeah. Uh, um, close at least. No, for me, I think power creep is a really big issue in literary stories, especially if you're gonna have them over an expanded series of more than three books, um, because you have to keep that RPG progression going throughout the entire series and not make them so powerful that it becomes laughable that they're not overcoming their their, their, their challenges. Uh, and so for me, I've always had like this hard end cap of like, not, nothing like hard set in this story, but it's still in my mind, like what's the average power rating for your regular farmer, your regular citizen? And that's usually about the starting point or maybe a little bit below that for my uh, characters that are transported into the world. And having kind of an end point, like, oh, this is my end game content. The same way you would think about it in terms of an MMO, like what am I doing towards the end and kind of spacing, uh, I have an idea of like wh what kind of level of progression I'm having in each particular book and matching their challenges, whether it's questing or just saving the world stuff to, to match that kind of expected um, level power. And for half credit, Eric. <laughs> um, I take it a slightly different way. Um, I, I look at it in that you can become overpowered, but not in every single way possible. So a lot of the times I'm looking at finding ways where characters who are overpowered in a barbarian sense are having to deal with problems that are intellectual based or problems of, of and, and beginning to see you know, that even though they want to look at the world as a nail, and they're the hammer, that sometimes there are those problems they can't overcome, even though they are so overpowered in a certain area. Okay. All right, so this next question is going to be for 20 points. As the lit RPG genre splits off into more subcategories, seeming to leave, be leaving the video game immersion behind to evolve into other areas, where it makes it more than uh, just a game, how does one control the ever-growing snowball of introducing science and technology to a new world? Audience? Eric, Eric gets it. <laughs> just, it's sorry. Of hair. <laughs> just, just half a level over you, I guess. Uh, part of it is, is understanding the manner in which that you are uh, building the world and how your characters come into that world. And so if you have it so that, that people are coming in and out all the time, you have to understand how to say that certain things will or won't work. And so, for example, I had people asking, you know, why do ships not have cannons? Like, why gunpowder has, has not been invented? And I had to deal with that, which is having wizards understand that they can heat up metal from distance. So that becomes the thing that they know gunpowder exists, but there's not a reason to have it anymore. And so it's, it's finding that balance where you can have the, the sort of natural progression of technology and how things are happening in that world, and then seeing how that's going to play out over the longer term. Okay, and for half credit, James. Ah, yes. <laughs> uh, and really, this is cheap because I feel like Michael Chatfield would answer this way better than I would. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see the question of Michael Chatfield since he does so much of this in the Ten Realms. It's a, he's he's gonna give a better answer. So Michael Chatfield, I defer to you, sir. Plus 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 five to him for good sportsmanship. Well, thank yeah. you, Kat, right. sir. <laughs> Um, yeah, adding science tech uh, to the world, it's, it's interesting. Um, you've got to look at it in like a couple of different layers of like, okay, is this going to be something that evolves through the books? If it is, then you have to figure out how is it going to evolve through the books. Is it part of the game system where you buy new guns, say? Like in shooters, as you level up, you get new guns. But is it 
if it's in a world where there's crafting, is it you have to craft new things. Um, so the example I have is like, if you have like guns in fantasy, because that's kind of what I do, sorry. Um, but it, what happens is you have, okay, there's guns, but there's armor. And then they have to, you have to have opposites so that they equal out to one another. So you have that tension at all times, but it also means that, okay, if the armor increases, the guns have to increase, and how much do you want to spend on that? So when you're adding science and tech into stuff, you really have to look at not only where is the cool ideas, but where are the ideas that you can sustain through the story, and then you have to apply like a power creep level to those as well. Because if you don't, then you have the whole problem of, okay, you have one gun that's gonna kill everyone, like the men in black, like little uh, pistol, you know, it'll destroy everything. The noisy cricket, thank you. Um, but it's like, you know, adding in that stuff is, you gotta look at how do you wanna use it in your world? Does it work for your world? And are you gonna want to develop that further or just leave it as it is? Because you can just have it as guns are guns and that's gonna be fine. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, but just look into the future of what you want to have it do. Okay, excellent. Very good, but only have credit. Uh, <laughs> all right, so, uh, so this is gonna be a 10 point question because it is a fairly easy one. All right, how important is editing to your process? Your hand was up already, I'm sorry. Who, anyone else? Say that again. Say it again. Diniman. Diniman. It's crucial. Um, so many authors, I find they say I edited it, I had my Aunt Trudy edit it, and it's great, it's great. And then, I mean, we all know as indie authors, the first thing we do when we get a print copy of the book, we open to a random page and the first thing we're gonna see is a typo. Um, it is, after the cover art, I feel it's the single most important part of the book writing process or book publishing process. Um, and lit RPG especially, because a lot of times there's math involved. And you need someone to edit who knows, or at least loves the genre, to pay attention to that sort of thing, um, at the very least. Because it's really easy. If you, a lot of times, if you screw up something on chapter two and it's a progression sort of system, it kind of, it can throw your whole book off and then you you need someone to tell you about it, or you need a, a, a fresh set of eyes. Oh, and James? Yes, this one I actually do have a great answer for, because I run a publishing company, and uh, so we do a lot of editing, and so obviously it's important. I think the quality in the genre has increased dramatically over the past couple of years, uh, and that means that we, we are all not necessarily in competition with each other, but as a whole, if the genre gets better, if you don't have a book that has a good cover, that has good ad copy, that has good editing, readers are going to find books that do have those things because those options are available. So it's more important now, certainly, than it was when the genre sort of was first had its inception. Uh, with that said, I want to give some pragmatic advice on how to edit because a lot of authors, especially new authors, don't necessarily have actionable ways to edit their books. Um, one thing that I think is has helped me and has helped a lot of our authors uh, is and I, and I know not everybody's an outliner, I know there are a lot of discovery pants or writers out there, and that's okay. Um, but I think that if you're looking to increase the sort of performance of your books and the speed at which you can put books out, which is a big part of what this conference is about, being able to outline is going to help you tremendously for one very critical reason. You'll be able to do developmental edits at the outlining stage, looking at the book as a whole, and fix any giant plot points before you actually write the book, because it's much easier to edit a paragraph in an outline than it is to edit 10,000 words after you get to the end of Act 3 and you realize, wow, I have a character in Act 1 that doesn't pay out, doesn't go anywhere, this quest doesn't get resolved. If you fix those things first, you won't have to fix them back. And those developmental edits are the things that are gonna bog down your release time and your strategy. So if I could give you one piece of editing advice, obviously, good copy editors, good proofreaders, but spend the time beforehand to nail down some of those nuts and bolts so you don't have these giant developmental edits that will, that will bog your book down four or five or six months. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that we also, as LitRPG authors, need to understand is the different types of editing that are going to be taking place because one of the facets of LitRPG is that you have an additional level of something happening in the book and it's best if you have someone who can look at that. 
So look at the game and how it's progressing and how if or if it's staying if everything is staying within the rules that you've established. Because the worst thing you want to do is to insert something into book two that is going to break the game by book four. As there are more than one series that have fallen apart because the game breaks and the books cannot continue. Beautiful. All right. So uh, next question here is, uh, this is a bit of a tougher one, so we're still at the 20, 20 point mark. Um, with the influx of popularity for Royal Road authors, especially just because I really love Royal Road myself, um, <clears throat> what is your take on Royal Road or going to uh, various uh, uh, online novel areas as a stepping stone to success? Ooh, audience. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone that's not him? Anyone disagree? You said Eric? Eric? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna give you a, a plus three dexterity bonus, a so plus three for him. Um, I would say that it's 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 hundred percent viable. Um, some of the, the, the bigger authors that are, are coming up are Royal Road, and some people are staying within that sort of um, uh, publishing free model. I mean, Pirate ABA is is huge and, and doing fantastically. Um, he Who Fights With Monsters came up that way. I would say that having looked at some of the other individuals who, who are still uh, in the trenches there, it is, it is not a clean path. That the, the loyal readers that you make on Royal Road are not following people over to Amazon to spend money. Uh, so you have to understand that. And, and you can also find yourself in trouble if, if you're not scrubbing everything off of Royal Road when you're trying to publish on Amazon because our genre is very heavily dependent on KU. I'm going to give it to Ramon. I know, James, you were faster, I saw, but I think he has good, good points for this one. So You get a minus one luck. Sorry, minus one for James. <laughs> yes, of course you get it. Minus one luck for James. Sure, no, um, for folks who don't know what Royal Road is, it's an online platform where people publish their stories online for free. There are other versions of this, including Wattspad, but a lot of lit RPG authors um, found their start on Royal Road, just publishing for fun, and they found success, and they found followers. And I think uh, for that purpose, it does a really good job. I know a lot of people are really nervous about, this is the first thing I'm writing, I don't know if lit RPG is for me, and I think sites like Royal Road and Wattpad provide a, a very nice platform to test your ideas out to see if they, can find an audience for your specific thing. Um, there are dangers in, in it in that uh, again, not, not all your followers are going to follow you to Amazon, and also some people will plagiarize your stuff. Uh, we've had several instances where that's the case. It is rare, um, but it is one of those things you should be aware of in, in keeping track of yourself and making sure you establish your copyright when you're, when you're writing your story. But I think for the purpose of, of finding a loyal audience and or to just testing out your story is because you're nervous about writing for the first time or, or writing your first liberty, I think they're absolutely wonderful. For, for zero points, I no, have no. something I would like we'll, to we'll, we'll still give you full half credit. Oh, you're sweet, Dakota. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I still have minus one for bad luck. Okay. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of disagree. I think that Royal Road does have a place, uh, but I think that especially with the emergence, you know, things like Sherlock He Who Fights With Monsters, some of those other big ones, Ran, Ranley Ghost Town that has just come out and has done well. A lot of these ones, Pirate Ab, all of those. People look at those and they think, oh, Royal Road is the path to success, and so that's where I'm going to invest my time. I'm going to tell you that it's a, like, it's a lot of work to, to post to Royal Road in a consistent way to build up an audience brand awareness. A lot of people who are not familiar with the situation on Royal Road will look at the success of those authors and they think that's how I am going to be successful. But what everyone here should know is that those authors were building those series for literal years. Some of those authors have been posting those stories for five years. If you build your brand for five years and then you transport it over onto Amazon, you're going to have success. But Royal Road is not a good platform if you're looking to, to put a book out in three months and then transport it over to Amazon. A lot of the people that are indie publishing looking at rapid release models, Royal Road is not going to serve you well because your book doesn't have enough time and enough exposure on that platform to gain the kind of followership that it's going to take. So if you are writing a series and you have no intention to publish it for the next two or three years and you want to put in the time on Royal Road to build that audience organically over a million words in three years, 
go for it. If your goal is, I'm gonna rush this to Royal Road, I'm gonna put it out for three months, and then I'm gonna take it to Amazon, the chances of you finding any kind of tangible success is not going to be high. It is very interesting to see how many people work for years to become an overnight success. True. Yeah. <laughs> Keep his microphone off. <laughs> All right. Like half the things we're, he we're says I want to disagree with. But, but we're gonna move on, because in seven minutes and 58 on. seconds, in seven minutes and 56 seconds, we're gonna be opening this up to the audience. So we have a couple more big questions here. All right, so this is a nice one, but for 15 points on this one, Ramon, get ready. All right. <laughs> <laughs> if you could recommend one lit RPG book by an author not involved with this panel, what would it be? Oh. Ramon! <laughs> uh, just because I'm a lit RPG podcast guy. Um, but, but one guy I'd probably recommend who has a, a lot of uh, underrated success recently is Stephanie M.A. Carlson. He had an absolutely great novel that came out recently, Purgatory, and he just didn't do as well. Uh, because it touched on some religious themes a little bit, but it was still a, a, a very great story, and he would, he would be the person I recommend uh, right now. Perfect. So I'm going to actually open this up for the whole panel for five five points a pop. So what what is one lit RPG book for from someone not on the panel that you would recommend? Just because it's an important thing to get brand awareness out. I would say actually uh, my to read right now is Town Under by uh, Katie Hanna. She's she's a good fun friend of mine, but it's also it's it's the it's, it's a, the apocalypse with lit RPG in Australia, which is like there's already enough death there, and then they've just added more. Um, so it's it's a hell of a lot of fun, and I'm just I'm really excited to go read it next. Uh, I would go with The Wandering Inn by Pirate Abba. Is this, it's just so much uh, that you can read, and it just shows the progression of writing skill over time. Uh, probably Shade Slinger by Kyle Kieran. Um, it has a talking axe named Frank in it, uh, and it's, it's, it's one of my favorite books of the past year. Um, it's a good book. I would say pretty much anything by Luke Chemowinko. I mean, he's not exactly an unknown author, but he's a really good writer. He's got some really good stories. Iron Prince is great. His, uh, his Ascend Online is a great series. So anything by him really is probably worth your time to read. Yeah. All right. That's good because one of, the, one of the great things about our genre is that all of our authors that are very successful tend to read heavily in our genre. Right? So it's, it's always good to know and, and see, like, get your name called out maybe, whatever it is. But, yeah, it's, it's always a nice thing to know that they know who you are. All right, so now um, now here's where the preparation for this and having gotten the questions in advance is really gonna show. Because uh, the next question is going to be worth five points for each point, right? There are, it's a five point question worth five points a piece, so up to 25 points, um, but I'm only going to give you two minutes. Okay, so what is your writing process distilled to five steps? Eric, Eric it is, and go, until the 13 minute mark. Uh, this is my process. Plan, build, play, fix, write. So to break that down with a little bit more, uh, planning is, is sort of planning what the game is gonna be and how it's gonna affect the plot. Building is the world building and making sure that the game fits in within it. Play is trying to break everything. Fixing is fixing all the stuff, both plot, story, character, everything to make sure it's all flowing well and that it's a real world feeling to what's happening. And then I sit down and write it all. That was good. For half credit, who was it? I didn't look. Oh, fuck. Chatfield it is, all right. <laughs> I think I just won that by just holding out longer. Um, <laughs> so I've got a pretty similar. Um, I do idea, gestation, write something else, write it, and then edit. Um, so idea is you're going to have a ton of ideas. That I usually find is that's why you have a gestation period and write something else. If you are still interested in it, you will also develop that story a lot more while you're doing something else. You'll be like, I really want to do that. Like I've been writing two, three books. I really want to go back and play with that. Um, then you get to actually write it, and then of course you gotta edit it, and then just clean it up, make sure everything's working, everything makes sense. But also, with your process, you really have to make sure that it fits your life. Like, that's, that's one thing we're really seeing like nowadays, like, 
it, if you're going to be doing this every day, your process has to be allowing you to do it every day. So to make sure that you have stuff like go eat good food, go drink water, go like move around a little bit, probably see your loved ones once in a while, you know? Um, like doing that stuff makes everything like healthy and you can do it for a lifetime. You can do it for 10, 20 years and, you, and it's a repeatable process. Um, so yeah, like as much as there are key things to do, Build your life to your system instead of your system to your life. Nice. Um, for flat five points, anyone want to go for a third time because we're still over? We still have time. Remote. Remote. Um, <laughs> sure. My process is kind of similar to Eric's, and that I have to have a nice brainstorming planning session about the game mechanics. I'm I'm I'm, I'm a game mechanics nerd. Um, I was the teenager who was in the, the library reading the D&D uh, workbooks, just like just like loving the number systems. Uh, so I do like a lot of like uh, game mechanic planning, like Excel sheets full of like multiple tabs full of stuff. But once I got have that fundamental system set up with kind of an automated sense to the Excel portion of it, so I don't have to worry about it so much during the actual writing. Um, then it's just me forcing myself to write because I'm an amateur writer. I'm not somebody who ever had a background in writing, so I always have to force myself to write on a daily basis. Uh, so my process is eventually. Um, planning slash brainstorming, then write, 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 and edit at the very end of like making sure everything works out and all my technical details. Okay, and now for just a moment of self um, of self promotion, what we're going to do here um, at the end of this one, we're going to open up the microphone for questions. Feel free to line up now if you'd like to. Okay, so so basically what I'm going to do is go down and for five points apiece, I'm going to ask each person. I want each person to tell me what they think they do best in writing that they could teach someone else, like if someone came up to them. And so if we just start with Ramon. Uh, probably the game mechanic and role development making sure the game mechanics work. I, like I said, I spend uh, hours on spell spreadsheets for game mechanics and just thinking of the amazing fun things that you can do with math and, <laughs> and game stuff. Um, it's really a, a heartfelt devotion to that kind of uh, math oriented thing. So I think that's probably the thing I do, I do the best. Um, this is this might be a weird one. Uh, character relationships, um, like the way that they work with one another. That I, it seems simple, but it's complicated. You know, it's like every relationship you have in the world. It's it seems easy until there's like something, and you're like, do I tell them? Do I not tell them? And you have to add those kinds of things into characters to make them realistic. But yeah, it makes it really difficult. But I I love it. It's good fun, and I think it would be something I would like to pass on to other people. I don't know if I could, but I try it. I think that I would have to say dialogue and like uh, banter, I suppose. Oh, okay. And uh, a repeat of the question here uh, is what do you think you do best that you could teach other people? So, if you want. Okay, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you can tell, talk people, to teach people how to talk to each other, great. Well, I, I don't think I could teach you. people how to talk to each other, but I could teach people how to write ah. in a manner, uh, write dialogue between people so it sounds more realistic. Uh, so it sounds like people are having actual dialogue between each other instead of just shouting monologues at each other. Perfect. So no as you know Bob in your book. <laughs> I, Eric stole my answer. Um, I was, I, I told him to say hair so he wouldn't say the same thing I was going to say. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I like everything I write, I have read aloud three different times. Um, I'm answering the question before. But um, so I, I, I feel I, I'll read it myself, I'll have someone else read it to me, and then I'll have the computer read it. And if the dialogue rings true to me, if it makes sense, if I don't feel like I'm watching some weird soap opera, then I know it's at least serviceable. And that's what I feel is my strength, is writing dialogue. I'm sorry, you've already had a job. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, kind of uh, two sides of the same coin. I would say uh, outlining and pacing. I think that these are things that especially beginning writers, uh, the pacing piece especially, get wrong. Um, there's a lot of really good storytellers out there, um, but that don't know how to pace novels well. When I review books that come through submissions or when I'm reading books, that's one of the things that immediately jumps off the page. The prose is good, maybe the dialogue is good, but the books are not well paced and they miss sort of crucial storytelling moments that makes it feel like this book is fine, but it's missing something. Uh, and that's something that I work a lot with the authors at Shadow Alley. Uh, I, I, 
do developmental edits on all the outlines that come through. And, and that's, those are the things that I always red flag is pacing issues where the, it's too action heavy. You, you need to know what the primary genre is so you know how many upbeats to downbeats you have um, so that the book feels organic. It, it, you know, it, it, the reverse is if it's a romance novel, you're gonna have a bunch of downbeats and very few upbeats. If it's an action adventure, lots of upbeats, sort of few sequence downbeats to sort of process that action. James, but no, if, I, if, I, if I may interrupt, it was if they came up to you. <laughs> Yes, sorry. You Anyways, but those, those are things that I think uh, are, are my strengths and that I could teach somebody else how to do well. Perfect. And uh, the only reason I interrupt is because we do have some questions. And uh, please, for anyone who's asking questions, choose one person that you would like to answer the question. Okay. Because you can always find us after the panel to get uh, a second uh, piece. As a copy editor in the lit RPG space, Dakota, this is specifically for you. I'm a moderator. <laughs> what? What can you give new authors to help them manage their math to make my job easier? Okay, um, so I know multiple people here do something similar, and since I'm a moderator, I just don't want to take the, the time from the panelists. So um, can you choose one other person that you could send that one to? Chatfield. Excel. Excel is amazing. Um, yeah, use Excel and also build Excel um, mechanics into it. They'll build upon one another, so if you change one thing, it'll ripple affect everything else. If you can learn how to do Excel in just a few shortcuts, it will help you out so much later on. Yeah. Ah, perfect. Yep. Yep. Setting up a system. Yep. Matt Dinneman, I want to know why, uh, why you were shaking your head a lot at uh, James when he was talking. So James was talking. Yes. <laughs> I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Earlier, he was talking about the editing. The most important thing to the editing process for him was to outline and to have to look at the story as a whole ahead of time, um, and that's a good way to edit and write more quickly. And I absolutely disagree with that. Personally, I um, I deliberately write myself into corners where I don't know how the hell I'm going to get out of it. I write pretty chaotically. I'll write the same scene five, six, seven times. Um, and then I pick the most ridiculous one that still makes sense. And then I move from there. And I, I, um, I, I do that and then I look at the, the book holistically when I'm done with it. And usually it still works. Um, sometimes I have to go back and fix things and it's a very dangerous way to write. But I personally feel like it's a viable way to write and it's a good way to breathe life into the story. I find when I write in outline form, the book tends to become, for me, a little stale. And that's my answer. Can I get that real quick? Nope. All oh, right. oh, come Next on. Person. Next All question. All writing advice is garbage. <laughs> no one knows they're talking about it. Every, everyone's <laughs> processing. All right, well, Negative luckily, 10 points for James. Luckily, you actually <laughs> saved me, because my question was always going to be directed at Michael anyway, since you're not answering questions. Uh, Mike, where do you get your inspiration for the cultivation elements in your story? Um, I was reading a lot of web novels, actually, um, and I got really interested by the systems that they were doing. Um, it took me a long time because I, what I wanted to do was combine cultivation with something I could actually show, so that was a lit RPG aspect, but I also really like like Western magic systems, and I was like, if I can relate those three things together, that would be awesome. But it took like months of just trying to figure it out and how to do it, but it was reading just a ton of uh, cultivation novels um, across like web novels um, that it, it was like, this is really cool. Like, this is a lot of fun. And then it was also like, I love the body tempering stuff over just like the, the, the I always mess up the pronunciation. I think it, it's chi and, and ki um, energies. Um, so I was like, okay, if I substitute that for mana, then that kind of works. And then it was allowing to, to mix those two systems together, which was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, cultivation came from web novels, um, which is, you know, the interesting progression of, you know, how it, different permutations of all different genres can come together to make something fun. Okay. And since we are under five minutes, I'm going to now limit all answers to 30 seconds or less. Okay. Next question, please. Uh, this, this one is for James, since you run a uh, small press and get your eyes on a lot of books. Uh, in the early days, Lit RPG was primarily VR or like Portal Fantasy. Uh, it's expanded a lot since then. Uh, but where do you see that going in the future for the genre? Uh, yeah, really quickly, um, VR does seem to be sort of out of vogue. There's a lot of books in that space, and so I think readers are kind of burnt out on that. There's exceptions to that. Um, I think post-apocalyptic is doing really well. Uh, cultivation and pro progression fantasy combined with game elements seems to be doing really well. 
Um, things like Dungeon Core, I still think, have a strong presence, and also things like Tower Climber. Looking at some of those less explored subgenres and niches, uh, I think, are the, the best place to move forward. Perfect. Great to uh, too. Thank you. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, how important, uh, I guess I'll ask Ramon, uh, how important new, entirely new game mechanics are for a new series as opposed to using game mechanics that people are familiar with, such as D&D. I think you're always taking a risk when you're trying to introduce something new that you're not, that people don't have a recognition of. Like, it's much easier to world build with D&D mechanics because people have a familiarity with them, so you don't need to spend a chapter describing uh, your, your entirely new and original system that may not make instantaneous success for them. But, at the same time, I would always appreciate uh, new twists on old systems. So having a unique aspect to something people are familiar with, whether it's an MMO system or a, or a gear system, I, th I think is probably the best combination of the two. Perfect. If you want to throw some points on this, that'd be great. It's for all of you. Nope. As a, this genre continues to boom and grow, we see a lot of readers just go absolutely bananas for anything new. What is a new genre that you personally would like to explore? You're going to have to pick so one so. person because we're at two minutes. So. Ah, very well. Then, Matt, what would you like to explore next? I, real quick, I, I'm, I always consider myself a horror author first. Um, everything I write, I consider horror. Um, even Dungeon Crawler Carl, I consider horror. And horror lit RPG subgenre is very small. It's not very popular. And I would like to see more authors and readers in that space. Uh, one of my favorite things about Lit RPG is the action in particular. And just a fun question is, what is the most unique or enjoyable way that you actually had to kill a character? For, For anybody. No, nope, pick one. James. Oh my gosh. Uh, you should pick somebody else. I hate killing characters. Killing characters is the worst part of writing books. I, I feel like Matt should answer this because he kills characters in some... I'm writing a scene you. that kill a very beloved character right now, and the best way is, 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 just make it as awful as possible. But I'm not killing the cat. But um, <laughs> sword through a dwarf into a chair, exactly. All right, we and, have a minute left, so. And the final question from the audience. Uh, this is to Michael, who I believe was the gentleman that said the game mechanics are as important as everything else. And my latest game has no real mechanics. I have an AI who does an algorithm any way she damn well pleases. Um, do you think I can go with that, or should I start to rewrite now before I get too far into it? It depends, right? It depends on the story. Um, it depends how you want to have it come across. Stats allow you to basically have a signpost that says, this is what's happening. But if you can write it in of a dialogue or like a, you know, a narration of this is what's also going on, it, it'll work. Um, you just have to make sure that you don't lose the reader. That is really the, the biggest thing. If you go through and you give it to uh, beta readers and something and say, like, ask them the, that question at the very end and be like, hey, did you, were you lost in any of these systems? Did it not make sense? And if they say, yes, I was lost, then you can go back and fix that. But use right. betas, definitely. All right, everyone, I wanted to say thank you all for being here. Uh, we are out of time at this point. I would real quick like to uh, thank our cameraman in the back for doing such a phenomenal job, <laughs> keeping an eye on these guys. And for Trish up here, and for Trish up here for keeping us on schedule and on time with everything from the AV. Now, as, as everyone has been wondering, we do have a final winner with a final tally here. At 100 points even, the annual, the first annual Lit RPG three pound gummy <laughs> is going to Eric Dudley. <laughs> thank you all, thank you all so much for coming. Please talk to them, us, anytime you like. We love it. All right, have a good day.